just reminded me uh, that was a uh, that was a new link. So I, I was waiting on the old one, and it was waiting to let me in, and uh, to, for whatever reason. But but here here we are. Sorry, then we're a couple of minutes late. But uh, I um, I've got until um, ten o'clock, and I'm yeah, I'm yeah, all yours. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm so sorry. I'm uh, okay. I mean, <laughs> I will not. Uh, so, uh, I'm, okay. So, all right. It's working now. Uh, our audience is here. I'm so sorry. You know, we had a apologies bit of technical to the glitch. audience. <laughs> apologies, apologies to the audience. Um, is this uh, being recorded and uh, yeah. going to live on YouTube then? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I, I will share the link with you. Um, so, uh, for okay. So uh, as as usual, uh, um, I'm sorry. I'm just a <laughs> bit off the <laughs> my usual read them. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, so we, I wanted to ask you a, a few questions. And in the morning, I I, I, I read your book, um, Science Denial, and and based mm -hmm. on that, you know, I wanted to ask you some questions. And also, sure. my research looks into disinformation, misinformation, and science denial. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking into how disinformation, misinformation works in Bangladesh as opposed to Canada in, in a comparative study, but in rural setting. Sure. Um, could you tell us that first, you know, how did you pick interest in studying uh, post-truth? You are a philosopher by training and obviously philosophers mm -hmm. deal with truth. So how did you develop the interest in uh, post-truth? Well, the, the American election in 2016 helped. <laughs> <laughs> post truth <laughs> post truth was named the um oxford dictionary's word of the year in 2016 even before the election and i had been interested as a philosopher in the question of belief how people form beliefs how beliefs are denied and then it seemed and for many years i'm a philosopher of science and i've been studying science denial but it seemed to me that the problem of post truth was even worse than science denial. And in fact, that science denial was in some ways the pathway toward post-truth. Because we all know what science denial is. It's when people deny the you know facts that uh, science and evidence can't change their mind. But post-truth I define as the political subordination of reality. So it's politically motivated and it's not just about science it's about reality as a whole so in some ways i mean the problem just got worse and so i wanted to write about that um in your book uh when you went to the flat earth um conference mm -hmm. it seemed and you write about it that it seemed that people really don't can relate to truth without their identity and um mm -hmm. If this is the real case that <laughs> humans are incapable of um, examining our own identity, and you know, it, it sounds like an old philosophical question: is that know thyself? Um, could you could you talk about it? Is that facts yeah. don't essentially help? And in you know, your experience, yeah. the the problem. So so. I'm not making the hypothesis that all beliefs for everyone are a function of identity because that would mean that there could be no science, <laughs> right? Um, what I'm, I'm making the claim that um, when people are deniers, when they're refusing to change their beliefs on the basis of evidence, it suggests that something is wrong with their belief formation. You know, if they're talking about an empirical topic, say, because with a scientist, that person would change their mind based on evidence because that's what science means. So what's different about science denial? Well, you just said it yourself, the facts and evidence don't convince them to change their mind, Why not? which is shocking. And it affects how we should speak to them. But then the question arises, so why do they have those beliefs? It's because of their identity. And what I mean by that is that beliefs are often social, um, they are dependent in some cases on what we want to believe. And so, you know, there's a there's a sense in which, I mean, identity is really stronger than ideology. But when I say it's identity, what I mean by this is that people can get radicalized by disinformation, say somebody wants them to believe a falsehood. And then they find other people who believe that falsehood. 
and then maybe they meet them in person and they form a community, it's very hard to break them out of it. I found this with the flat earthers. Their, their belief was not just what they believed, it was who they were. So if I presented any facts to try to change their mind, it was not going to work because what I really needed to do was to change their identity to change their mind. So that is an even more difficult task than we thought. Do, do you think it takes us to the you know, chicken or egg problem when we talk about identity and we talk about mm -hmm. ideology? Uh, mm -hmm. In many cases, could we say that uh, identity is also influenced by ideology that I'm a conservative, I'm a liberal, or I am mm -hmm. of certain ideology. How, how do we how do we go about that? You know, there was a terrific study on this by Liliana Mason out of Michigan State University. And she was comparing the difference between identi identity and ideology uh, to see if they were the same. And what she concluded is that they were not the same that ideology was in a sense fungible. I mean, people change their, uh, their ideologies depending on what the other people in their identity group believe. Look what happened with the Republican Party of the United States and hostility toward Russia. That was part of Republican ideology for decades, but it changed. Why did it change? Because the identity changed, the, the identity of the party changed. In Mason's experiment, which was, which was just brilliant, she tested, she asked people, you know, would you object to living next door to somebody, dating somebody, you know, et cetera, who believed? And then she listed a bunch of ideological liberal beliefs, you know, who believe, who was uh, pro-choice, you know, somebody who thought that Black Lives Mattered, somebody who thought this, that, you know, she, she just went down the list of those ideological beliefs. And people's, and asked this of conservatives, and people's reaction, you know, was not always good, but it was much less hostile than when she framed it as, how would you feel to live next door to or for your, you know, to date someone who was a liberal? Then they know they hated it. They wouldn't do it. And it was the same vice versa, right? When you, the liberal identity was strong as well, as opposed to liberal ideology. Something about putting a label on it, something about saying, this is your team, not just what your team believes, but this is your team makes people dig in. Um, in your book, the chapter that fascinated me the most, and I know that um, my professors and a lot of them would be actually interested to know your opinion about it as well, your understanding and also your findings. You know, we go to university, we get educated, and we tend to incline towards progressive values, liberal values, and 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 and, and what have you. And your your understanding of GMO conspiracy for me was was and 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 when I question myself is that do I have reasons to trust companies like Monsanto? Do I have reasons to mm -hmm. trust big corporations that who have uh, uh, betrayed public interest yes. or you know time and again, time and yes. again? So y your book looks into and find out that even the liberals, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they can be susceptible to disinformation, misinformation, science denial? Yes. Well, it, 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 I raise it as a question in the book mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and because I wanted to examine uh, uh, this question to see whether it was predominantly uh, um, a function of ideology or identity, you know, one particular political identity. And there's some people who claim that it is. Um, there's a researcher named uh, Stephen Lewandowski, a brilliant cognitive scientist out of University of Bristol, who claims that all science denial tends to uh, skew uh, toward the right. And so I was interested in, you know, is is that, I mean, and, and he's a cognitive scientist. I mean, he backed it up empirically, but I, I wanted to look at some of the assumptions behind this. So one question is, I mean, the obvious question was anti-vax before COVID, because before COVID, anti-vax was about evenly split between liberals and conservatives. Now, they believed it for different reasons, right? The liberals tended to be anti-vax because they didn't trust big pharma, and the conservatives were anti-vax because they didn't trust government. So, you know, they could share the same ideology for different identitarian beliefs, I guess, if you want to look at it that way. 
the GMO question was really fascinating to me because there, as a narrow, a very narrow empirical question, scientific question, um, it has never been shown that GMOs uh, are unsafe to eat. Now, they could still be unsafe to eat and we don't have evidence for mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But the vaccine, the, the COVID vaccines could, you know, kill us 10 years down the road and we don't have evidence for that. And aspirin mm -hmm. could be, you know, uh, I mean, we just, there are things that could possibly be true, but they are, you know, we've looked and looked and looked and looked and there's no evidence for it. So it makes it very unlikely. Could be that the climate deniers are right and global warming is not a thing. Very, very, very unlikely. Okay. So, and in fact, the scientific consensus that GMOs are, haven't been proven unsafe to eat is even stronger. That, that is the, the gap between what the scientific consensus is and public opinion is even bigger than the gap between the scientists and the public on climate change. Amazing. So how do we account for this? Well, part of it, I mean, people can have legitimate reasons for not liking Monsanto, for being suspicious about corporations, for disputing the agricultural practices around pesticides that you know are used for raising uh, uh, certain GMO uh, uh, products. That is does not touch the narrow empirical question. And so I define the empirical question of is somebody a GMO denier as, you know, do they think that GMOs are unsafe to eat? And it's amazing to me that um, for some folks, the answer is yes. That is, they they even though the evidence is not there, their suspicions, their doubts, even amongst some liberals, though not the ones that I interviewed for my for my book, um, uh, show that uh, that this can happen, and that's a uh, that's a dangerous thing, I think. And what the reason I went into this question is because I wanted to make clear: science denial is not somebody else's problem; it's everyone's problem. And just because you are a liberal does not mean you are inoculated from science denial. It is still possible to want to believe something so strongly and be so suspicious of the empirical evidence, even when it's in your face that you keep yourself from, from believing it. Um, does more of it come from the right these days? Absolutely, it does. I just think that's, you know, climate denial, COVID denial, yes, in our face. Is it possible for there to be liberal science denial? I think it is. I mean, I mean, uh, unfortunately, our conversation, uh, because, uh, I mean, uh, it's my it's my bad. I mean, who will listen to this conversation let's, later? <laughs> no, no. I mean, let's 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 keep uh, let, let let's keep going. I mean, I've I've got a uh, I'll I'll tack on a few minutes at the at the okay. end. So just okay, do okay. do do your thing. I <laughs> I should have checked a little earlier when you didn't come on the screen. I should have checked my email to see that there was another Streamyard link, and uh, you know. But we're we're fine. We're in the conversation now. Please keep going. Thank you. Um, one of the things that is um. I mean, I, I've been teaching for the past 25 years and I come from a very small village in Bangladesh. So I, you know, grew up raising animals, growing crops. So I, I know firsthand that what is happening because of climate change. I yes. know at the moment because of, and this is firsthand experience. For me, this is empirical because I, I you know, I yes. have family members who have become climate refugees uh, yes. and and when you were talking about in your book is that your experience going to Maldives and that uh, young boy uh, on the boat telling you that people outside Maldives don't really care. So yeah, when it comes to disinformation, mm -hmm. I know that in Bangladesh, public lynching have happened because of disinformation. I know that we have, you know, uh, of, over a million Rohingya refugee right now. And I know that how Myanmar military has used disinformation to demonize uh, Rohingya Muslims, and now we have a humanitarian crisis. So, and also the recent um, um, uh, whistleblowing event in the United States has shown that Amer uh, Facebook uses 84% uh, of its budget to fight disinformation, misinformation in the USA, and only rest of it, I mean, 14%, something like that, you know, for the rest of the world. But majority of the data for 
tech titans come from outside us not from us because you know 300 right. million people in the in that mm -hmm. case i've yeah. sorry and they've got a translation problem too they don't always know facebook doesn't always know what's the disinformation being pumped into its site in in other languages english is easier for them to police yeah absolutely um and also it, it's a, it's also an economic decision because if you were to find out content moderators you know in myanmar or in bangladesh you could but you have to pay money and that's yeah, not a right. profitable decision um so in yeah. in that case do you th what are your concerns for countries like bangladesh we have <laughs> more than 100 million people connected to the internet we don't have sufficient resources to fight disinformation yeah. to fight you know um, scientific disinformation denial what are your thoughts about about it disinformation is a weapon of war i mean information warfare has been around for a long time modern uh, information warfare was invented um you know the modern information warfare by uh derzinski the uh, uh, uh lenin's uh head of the Cheka in 1920. And, but that's not to, and Russians are very good at disinformation, but there is disinformation all over the world. And it tends to be very attractive for authoritarian governments to use disinformation, not just as a weapon of war against its enemies, its foreign enemies, but against its own people. And we see this in, in Russia and China and other countries as well. So, you know, what are the resources to fight to fight back, it's it's so hard because the internet is a propagandist dream. I mean, the internet uh, allows you to find truthful information, but it can be drowned out with misinformation and disinformation. And especially when that news source is controlled by the government, that's difficult. I mean, so, you know, we think of um, before the internet, about state-run television okay and you know what that meant for you know because when it's information censored only the, you only get information from the government you know that makes it very uh, you know very hard to do something well okay so then we got cell phones and the internet and it's a little more democratization and people you know uh sometimes they in other countries, they primarily, and even in the United States, they primarily get their news from, you know, cell phones, uh, you know, looking at Facebook, you know, other places. I mean, this is, you know, how it's done. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're finding true information. Of course, I think disinformation is the new censorship. You know, if if a regime cannot, if a regime can censor an authoritarian regime, it will. But in the absence of the ability to censor, disinformation works almost as well. I don't know if you know the uh, the film um, Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail, the, the Harrison Ford film. It's an adventure film um, where this uh, professor of anthropology is a you know the, the hero of the movie, and he goes off to my my dog's having a dream here so you're hearing a little commentary um, <laughs> he, he goes off to find the holy grail and he finds it except it's surrounded by a hundred fakes and he doesn't know which of the fakes are the actual holy grail that's what disinformation is like you can have the truth right in front of you but you cannot tell it from the disinformation now, if you're asking, and, and my dog doesn't know either, um, if you're <laughs> if you're asking though what to do about it, I, I I'm at a bit of a loss. I mean, certainly the social media companies bear responsibility for policing disinformation, but how have they chosen to do that? They put up, they flag questionable content. Well, okay, that's tiny. They, they that's like I saw a commercial from Exxon Mobil the other day talking about all the green energy stuff they're doing. Well, I'm sure they are, but it's one percent of their budget, right? They're they're doing a little bit so they can advertise about it, but they're not doing enough. Um, I'm hoping that 
when the American Congress finally figures out what the internet is and what it's capable of, that there will be some sort of regulation uh, surrounding the algorithms, because I think it's the algorithms that are doing a lot of the damage. Um, uh, that you know, the algorithms that if you look at disinformation and then it pushes more disinformation could be tweaked. They could be used to be less polarizing, to, to promote true information. I just I think that would that would be better, um, I, but I I can't I can't solve that problem. I mean it is, I, I'm so glad you brought it up in the way you did. It is a worldwide problem and potentially even worse. I mean I remember a story from India the other day about um, uh, deaths, assassinations as a result of uh, disinformation on Facebook. I mean they they bear responsibility for not doing more to police this yeah yeah and and when you i'm, I'm glad that you have brought the question of algorithm um uh, sushana's buff you know attacks it very well explains it very well that it's not essentially the digital uh infrastructure that is the problem but what is the logic that yes, operates the digital that's right and it, it so this is what you know we are living in the time of attention economy that your attention is the most profitable commodity yeah. in order to engage us to internet conspiracy theory disinformation mm -hmm. is way more effective than oh, other yes. strategies that that's right they're fascinating they pe people people spend more time clicking on and sharing the the fake stories than the real ones because the real ones are sexy the real yeah. ones have you know, the, I mean, they're called clickbait for a reason. I mean, the, you know, they they draw us in. People share stories without even having read the story. They just share it, you know, based on the uh, based on the headline. And and it is a it is a tragedy that it works that way because the the thing that makes me really angry about it is that this is actually information warfare, and it's not just a mistake. It's warfare by means of disinformation, and people are asleep to that problem. In the American media, they're just beginning to talk about disinformation. They treat it as if it were misinformation, as if it were an accident, like a, a car wreck that nobody could have seen coming. Yeah, that's a problem. I think, yeah, absolutely. I think, at least in my uh, in Bangladesh case, I can tell you. Uh, so Oxford Internet Institute publishes uh, a disinformation report every year. The report that came out in 2020, 2020 shows that um, 81 countries are not, not general people like me or an average Joe. It's a government that is involved in disinformation. So you have cyber trooper. You have rich countries, yeah. you have computationally very powerful countries, they're engaged in disinformation campaign to uh, for their own political propaganda and also to engage in information warfare. But I think not calling it yes. information warfare is not doing us a service, at least in, Bang in Pakistani case, I can tell you that somebody created a fake, I mean, disinformation that, oh, um, uh, Israel is uh, holding Pakistan responsible that why they're not solving problem X or something. And this is that you can look it up. The, is the Pakistan's defense minister, not an ev everyday person, responded, tweeted back saying Israel should be mindful, should be careful, uh, blaming a country that is powered with nuclear weapons. Yeah, oh, yes. Th th this almost started a war. <laughs> yes, I, I, I know that case. It just incredible based on a fake story yeah uh, a few researchers in america and you have also touched on it you know in your book um uh, how to talk to science denier it seems like uh, dean freelon is one of them it looks looks like how the external uh, uh adversary forces like russia russian disinformation campaign they mm -hmm. attacked they, look, they tapped onto existing social uh, problems in the United States. Yes, and it they, seemed, and right. it looked that the racial line works the best. Could you expand on that and how how to go about yeah. it? What one one tactic in uh, a disinformation campaign that the Russians have really perfected is not to just invent something, you know, that nobody already 
cares about and then try to get them to care, you know, not just a lie out of the blue sky, but to find an existing crack uh, and, and maybe with a kernel of truth to it and then try to widen it. So, you know, Russia, and, and it's a very low investment for them. They have troll farms um, that, you know, that's what the Internet Research Agency in Russia, which has since been renamed. But um, that's what they do. Uh, and they try to make, and part of disinformation is to make it look like they're not doing it. So, you know, they'll comment on news stories as if, you know, they were uh, Americans or, you know, and they, they prize uh, people who can speak English very well, you know, for this reason, because the people reading it, you know, don't know. And, and I mean, there are famous cases in the election, the 2016 election of, you know, this thing about Texas seceding mm -hmm. from the union or, um, you know, and they, they did exploit uh, uh, racial divisions as well. I mean, this is, this is why I say it's warfare. It's insidious, right? And here's the message that I really want people to hear. The best way to win an information war is to know that you're in one. Because if you don't know that you're in one, then you're just confused and disoriented and you don't know who to trust. And that is the point of information warfare. And, and you brought up an excellent point a moment ago, which is that pe when people hear the word warfare, they think, oh, that's state to state. Russia does a, a campaign of disinformation against the United States. Um, but disinformation is also used domestically. And in fact, I think that that was what happened with Donald Trump. People in the United States and perhaps around the world dismiss him as a buffoon. He's a clown, an idiot. He is a genius when it comes to propaganda. He is the person who... Absolutely. He is the person who, for the first time in American history, took Russian disinformation tactics and applied it to American politics. And we didn't know what hit us. And we still don't. I think a lot of people, you, you know, you look at governments around, the, uh, you look at populations and countries around the world, maybe they're used to not trusting information that comes out of their government or their media. They're more suspicious. Americans were used to maybe the myth, but the, the belief that truth was available, that their government didn't tend to lie to them, that the media didn't tend mm -hmm. to lie to them, that they could, you know, pick up a newspaper and it was, you know, if they could buy that newspaper, it was uh, put together with good journalistic values. And then all of these other media players crowded in. And then the <laughs> Trump came into the government and started to lie. How many? 30,000 times? I forget <laughs> what the total was. But I mean, that is a Russian tactic. That's called the fire hose of falsehood. And Putin uses it all the time. And the point is not simply to convince somebody that a falsehood is true. The point is to so demoralize the population that they think that the truth can't be knowable because then they're easier to rule. So, you know, and, and Americans being Americans, they think they have nothing else to nothing to learn from the rest of the world. But if we would look at how this is used in Brazil, you know, in Indonesia, in other countries, we would see, yes, this is an effective tactic that is used domestically. And look what happened in Hungary during their election. That is what happened in the American election. But we don't learn. And the, the Americans are very far behind, I think, on realizing the... Uh, the power of disinformation to polarize, alienate, and ultimately lead to violence. I think an excellent book, I mean, one of the excellent books that I have read and I'm reading, uh, I'm, I'm consulting it again, it's for American case, and obviously I, I, we have a lot to learn from it, you know, from Bangladesh as well. It's called Fantasyland. Huh. So um, in, in that book, uh, the author explores, uh, his name is Kurt Anderson. He looks into that how America's foundation is built on so many mythology 
so many lies that you know, it was not inhabited by anybody. You know, Europeans are welcomed by the indigenous right. people. Yeah. And then I have, have found another book, especially for science denial, uh, the concept of iatrophobia, that why... Yeah. So the concept of iatrophobia, Harriet Washington, you know, she looks into that why black people uh, distrust medical institutions. Mm. And uh, she looks into the history that yes. how, and her book is called Medical Appetite, is that so black people don't trust white medical institutions and, you know, what has happened to them. So if this is the evidence that we have, we have reasons to distrust government. We have reasons to distrust, even a lot of uh, medical literature was found that where it was yes. literally citing from Bible. Mm -hmm. Uh, we talk about Andrew Wakefield, so it's in many ways it's nothing yes. new. <laughs> no, no, it, it's not. And and I mean the Tuskegee experiment and Henrietta Locks are, are well known. Another example that comes to mind is pain research. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, I mean, they, there are yes, there are examples uh, that mm -hmm. you know. I'll, I'll have to read that book. Thank you. In that case, can we? If I have an abusive partner who beats me up on a regular basis, can I trust him? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a question. I don't have an answer. It's a provocation, like, because I'm researching that as well, and I, I'm at a loss. And obviously, one thing that I must say, we do not have even a fraction amount of conversation about climate change being one of the worst victims of climate change in public. It's the researchers who have research interest in researching, getting funded. Yeah. And you, you can you can also yeah. uh, probably uh, reach out to him if you're interested. I've talked to a professor from John, uh, John Hopkins, Professor Wesley Moy. He looks into disinformation uh, from the military. Uh, mm -hmm. because he has been in the military for almost 31 years. He, was in, he has worked in the intelligence community in the USA. Mm -hmm. I asked him this question and I asked him this question as well. Even today, Global North looks at disinformation as a technical problem, mm -hmm. hence needs a technical solution. Right. So if American military or the Global North studies that how disinformation is spread in digital spaces, this actually becomes a military tactic and weapon for them if they need to use it in future. Yes. But not the political economy, not the history, that how the power divide between global north and right. global south, we are at a loss. How do you think about, I, I didn't plan to ask you this question, when you look at the political economy of disinformation, lies, science denial, there's mm -hmm. a political economy. Yes. What are your thoughts about it? Science denial, I mean, I'm primarily interested in science denial, but reality denial is, you know, what this has turned into. But I think there's a lesson at the heart of science denial, which we all need to think about, which is that science denial is not just one thing. Science denial, it can exist on a spectrum, but people are radicalized to move down that spectrum. They start with doubts and they end with distrust. Next thing you know, maybe they believe the earth is flat. Okay, so that's one. So there is diversity uh, in in uh, in that way. But the other thing is that science denial tends to be topical. People aren't anti-science. They're against the science that impinges on whatever their particular ideological beliefs might be. So you find science deniers around evolution and the shape of the earth and vaccines and climate because there are special interests that people have around that. With evolution, it's religious ideology, okay? With um, vaccines, used to be, uh, you know, a liberal and political, uh, a political ideology, but today, mostly right-wing political ideology. Climate change, interesting, right? Climate change, um, a lot of the disinformation was fed from the people with fossil fuel interests. So it was an economic motivation, but it became a political uh, uh, motivation. It trace all of that back to the really, the beginning of modern science denial in the 1950s, when the American cigarette companies 
were worried about a study that was going to show a link between smoking and lung cancer and hired a public relations specialist to help them. And his advice was fight the science, which they did through public relations, not through science. But that campaign was so successful that it was copied by every science denial campaign since. So whether the motivation was economic or political or ideological, they all did the same thing. They all followed what's called uh, Naomi Oreskes in her wonderful book, Merchants of Doubt, calls the tobacco strategy. And it's the creation of doubt where there previously wasn't any um, toward whatever that interest is. So it's not it's not necessarily just economic or just political or just ideological. It, it, it's it, because it depends on what kind of disinformation. So the question that I ask with a with a, a denialist campaign is not just why do people believe the false information, but whose interest is it to have them believe that false information? Because sometimes the you know if it's disinformation, it's intentionally created. That's the difference. Misinformation is an accident, but but disinformation is a lie. The one that I can never figure out is flat earth. Who would possibly benefit from that? There doesn't seem to be any economic or ideological or political motivation behind it. I don't really know where that one came from. COVID denial, climate denial, I know where those come from. It's, it's not hard to figure out who's the money and the political interest uh, be, behind those. But to answer your original question, Part of um, part of disinformation is to hide itself as just being common sense, just you know being whatever anybody might think. And that has deep roots that I have not explored, but other researchers certainly have in uh, racism, in discrimination against, as you put it, the global South by the global North, just things that seem like assumptions that we can make that are fine, but because we haven't examined them, we haven't figured it out. I think that misinformation is no less dangerous than disinformation because it can be, if it starts with a lie in somebody's interest, but then it's shared by the millions who think that it's true, it's still dangerous. To fight it, though, you have to figure out where it came from. And that's why I enjoy you making the book recommendations because we need to get to the bottom of where some of these myths and lies have come from originally. Who did it serve to believe? And then, you know, fill in the blank. That's that's how you undo it. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, I, I will send you a paper that was published very recently, probably uh, less than a month ago. And that got best one of the papers award from Cornell University. So one of the doctoral students from Bangladesh, she's studying disinformation in Bangladeshi oh, context like great. me. And she found out, and I'll probably, you will probably find some connection to flat earth here, probably. <laughs> so, so the thing is, in the rural Bangladesh, you have vaccine in the United States, there are people don't want to take vaccine and we are not getting vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, similar to Canada, where I'm situated right now, I have a huge family and I know that they're not getting vaccine. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so she went to the villages of Bangladesh and she has talked to people, is that how do they understand COVID? And what are the kind of cures they are thinking about? And you will see that people believe in all kinds of mythologies, miracles, and, and et cetera. That reminds me of Marx, uh, when Marx talked about that religion is the opium of the mass. At the same time, Marx also talked about when a system don't care about people. Yeah. In a capitalist yeah. system. Yeah. It... The second part, I'm not sure I have an answer for because it goes back to the Maldivian fishermen. How do you get somebody to care about something that they don't care about? I've been so concerned with changing people's beliefs. And it wasn't until I talked was in the Maldives that I realized it's not just about belief. It's about caring, because even if you could change the beliefs of 
you know, a, a whole bunch of people. If you don't change their behavior, it's not going to work. And what really motivates people is who they care about. And if you don't know anybody from the Maldives, maybe, you know, you see the story on the news and you change the channel and you think, well, that's too bad. They'll have to move, which is, if you've ever been there, heartbreaking. It's absolutely, you know, so it, once you, once you can put a, a, a name and face on it, once you know people, once you visited the islands and you see the sea level is, you know, they're one meter above sea level, a, a wave could, you know, wash it out. It's, it's, that's why I went because I wanted to be able to, to talk about this with firsthand knowledge. Deniers are always saying, oh, do you have firsthand knowledge? Have you been there? Yes, I was there. Okay. Um, so I, I can't answer the, the Mark's question is, is too, uh, is, is too difficult uh, for me. But the initial part of your question, which, damn it, I now forget, um, say, so just, just remind me quickly the, the, the yeah. first part of so, the question. So if people don't, if, if people understand that they live in a system where they're just a, like a, in the, in the movie Matrix, like we're a battery <laughs> for a huge machine's right. need. So the machine <laughs> don't care about us. Yeah, it's it's hard because I think that your friend who going out and talking to people individually mm -hmm. is the answer because you're not going to get people necessarily to give up their religious or political beliefs. But what you can do is get them to trust people who maybe don't share those beliefs how do you and so that they'll listen to factual information and how do you do that you do that through face to face conversation and that's what my book is about it's about the value of talking to people that you disagree with calmly respectfully patiently because this works i have examples that i explore in the book of how this works mm -hmm. uh, some of the most shocking examples aren't even from science denial some of the most shocking examples are, are there's a, uh, uh, an African-American uh, musician in the United States named Daryl Davis, mm -hmm. who has taken it upon himself to convert people out of the Ku Klux Klan. N now, <laughs> he gets them to give up their robes. To, he has 200 Ku Klux Klan robes. How did he do that? He did that through calm, patient, respectful conversation. Because they had never maybe met a black man who, in person, that, you know, didn't, that, that shot all the stereotypes that, you know, in a conversation that the fact that he didn't react with anger sort of diffused it. I have an example from science denial as well. There's a young woman that I've, I've come to know through um, several projects that I've, that I've done. I've never met her in person. I can't wait. She's 18 years old, and her name is Lena Yassin, and she is a climate activist in the Sudan, in Africa, and she is a Muslim, um, as everyone in the Sudan is, um, but she goes to visit people to talk about the reality of climate change and how the facts about climate change are not inconsistent with the Quran. That in fact, you know, so she she can quote from the Quran about the you know taking care of the earth, et cetera, et cetera, and to just try to demonstrate, you know, through her own activism, uh, she is the next Greta Thunberg, I believe. I mean, she she's done conversations with the Aspen Institute, the Vatican. She's now just got into Oxford University. You know, because she's a young person, she hasn't gone to college yet. She's been doing this since she was 14. I mean, people, grassroots conversations make a huge difference. I wish that everyone could have friends in other countries so that they knew what was going on, so that they knew the issues. Because, I mean, the other problem is the American media just does not report on foreign news unless it affects the United States. So you, you could interview a thousand people on the street in New York City today, 
and ask them about the Rohingya and, and they could not tell you the first thing about the issue. And, and it's, you could say it's because they don't care. But there's another reason, because part of the reason why they don't care is because the American media is not reporting on it to make them care. Now, they would say, well, it's because we couldn't get anybody to watch the news. Nobody would, you know, they just changed the channel. What a cop out. I mean, there, there are, it, it has been part of my burden in talking about denialism for people to realize that this is a worldwide problem, just as disinformation is a worldwide problem. The, this People in the United States don't, sometimes don't believe a problem until it happens to them. Here it is. But this is not the first time that disinformation has led to distrust and led to denial. It happens all over the world every day. And by the way, we in the United States, we could learn from other countries. Finland has a wonderful program of uh, media literacy that starts in elementary school. They teach those kids to be critical thinkers. I mean, there are models all around the world of what we could be doing that we're not doing. Um, my trip to the Maldives was the first time that I had been, uh, you know, uh, that close to the equator. It was really my first trip to Asia. It was heartbreaking. It was beautiful, but it was heartbreaking because I began to realize just how many people in the world were affected by American and other countries like China's inaction on climate change. It was really, I mean, what could I say to that kid when he said, no one cares? I do, and I can name him a lot of people who do care, but ultimately he was right. The interesting code of that conversation is that I then, after that, went to speak with coal miners in eastern Pennsylvania, about as close to the West Virginia border as you can get, coal country. And I went in there naively thinking, well, they're going to uh, think that climate change is a hoax because they go down in the mine every day and earn their living at this. No, they thought climate change was real, which was fascinating to me. And they too were victims of the disinformation and the coal industry's greed because they're in their communities, they were poor and they didn't have any other employment opportunities. And they go down there every day in the mines risking their lives. There are only 50,000 coal miners left in the United States. Can't we do something to help them do the green energy jobs, cap all those methane uh, leaks that we have in the United States? Other, th I mean, it's 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 heartbreaking. And then you read that um, just how much coal, m most greenhouse gas comes from China. And the number one contributor is Chinese coal. In India, coal is widespread. I don't I imagine it is in, in Bangladesh too. I mean, we've got to stop using coal. And yet, because of the political interests in the United States and one senator, from West Virginia in the United States, we cannot seem to do what we need to do about coal. It is heartbreaking. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you would like, I could put you uh, on a discussion with uh, 15, 20 young people from Bangladesh who fairly all understand English and can converse with you. And uh, reading, I know that you know, we'll have to, your time, you have to have another appointment. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, the connection between the coal miners' uh, fatalistic attitude that they're going to die anyway. Yes. Um, in Bangladesh, I can tell you uh, seeing an entire island yes. gone. Um, and so we think, yeah. uh, a lot of us, uh, that, you know, it's it God's wish. You know, so it's the similar. So here, again, the mythology and yeah. the disinformation. And so... How wonderful I, I, would it be to get the coal miners and the the people on that island together to speak? I think they would have more in common than anyone imagines. Yeah. If you want, I can put you in touch with a filmmaker who made a film. He made a film on an island, and after the film was made, the island is gone. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I'd love I, to send me the link with with the film. I, I've seen the island president uh, film about uh, Maldives, but this uh, this film, yes, please, and and I'd like to uh, I'd like to stay uh, in uh, in touch um, yeah. because yeah. these are 
it's very easy even for me to feel like well this is an american problem look what just happened to us but this is this is a worldwide problem though america contributes to it through our media and and the pollution and um attention uh, uh disproportionately yeah exactly uh, uh professor mcintyre i would I, this conversation we have never finished but i look forward to have a second episode of this conversation with a lot of your research and um, I would like to put you in touch with people in Bangladesh who are also working with disinformation, misinformation, trying to combat mm -hmm. it without without not having a lot of resources. I can tell you that. And, and probably we can collaborate. Probably, you know, we can learn from each other that basically what mm -hmm. works and, you know, understand this is one world. Thank you very much for making the time. And this wasn't, <laughs> I, I didn't mean to finish it so quickly, but I know you have an appointment. I, and again, I, I'm sorry about the beginning. I, I hit I hit StreamYard and then I just sat here and played my guitar for a minute waiting for you to log on. And then I thought, wait a minute, <laughs> I better check my email. <laughs> so we, we did, uh, we did get to it, but let's make up for that by having a second conversation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor McIntyre. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it.